Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Justin Perkins. This is Top Junkie. Before we get started with today's episode, I want to get a couple things out of the way. Send in any comments, mail, anything you have to authorjperk at gmail.com. I done a mailbag episode not too long back. It got great responses. Uh, people I don't know really liked it. Uh, two or three people I do know really liked it. Uh, a person I'm really good friends with loved it. Said it was his favorite episode. Um, I, I've got some mail in. Uh, I've got one from somebody that really liked it, and they've got a, a very good question uh, that I'd like to answer. But I kind of like to do it all in a mailbag deal. Um, but for whatever reason, for everybody to like the mailbag episode so much, people quit sending in mail after the mailbag. Not completely, so it's not I'm not seeing your mail. There is some in. But, you know, last time I probably had 15 or 20 new ones to dig through. I don't have that this time. You know, I'd like to have, you know, what I've already got plus 10, 15 more. So authorjperk at gmail.com. Send those in, and we'll get one of those episodes underway. Uh, I like to shout out businesses and things of that nature on here. I'm an author. The reason that address is authorjperk at gmail213. Or, no, it's not 213. Ugh, I keep getting the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. It's authorjperk at gmail. Um, it's because I am an author and I've wrote some books, and those books are available at the Red, R E A D, Red Spotted Nuke Bookstore in Hazard, Kentucky. Look them up on Facebook. They're selling online and things right now amidst the great plague that we're in. Um, I just ordered some music off of a company called Roundabout Music in Wattsburg, Kentucky. They've got uh, cassettes. They've got vinyl. They've got CDs. They've got local artwork. So does the Red Spot Nuke. Great place to go. You can find them on Facebook as well. I don't get paid by any of these places. I promote them because I enjoy them. Also, two new podcasts that are out there. One, uh, Relics of the Past. It's only available on Google and uh, Anchor currently, but it will be on... um, iTunes soon. It's just super hard to get that. Great new, it's different different than anything I've listened to before. Uh, they've got a little, um, like, he, he does different things on there, but right now he's got a little series on there uh, called OTR, Old Time Radio. He plays you some stuff, especially if you're in the Old Time Radio that you can't find anywhere else. So he's found some copies of great stuff. Uh, also, there's a new podcast called Randomness Captured Alive. Uh, it's not actually a current podcast. This is a podcast that was recorded in the past for the future for the survivors of the coronavirus. I've not listened to anything else like it. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's funny. But it's always entertaining, so check it out. It is up on iTunes already. Uh, check both of those out. Today, today we're going to do that very thing. We're going to speak about technology. Uh, Christian Lang said, Technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master pretty accurate thing. I mean, what we've done, what we've created as man uh, and women, as humankind, I guess I should say, what, what, what we've created is a marvel. You look at the where we are now as to where we were a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago. Now we have to stop there because we don't know really much before that. I am of the utmost belief that we were probably fairly sophisticated and um, pretty advanced at other points in time and that um, various disasters have... But that's null and void. That's a different podcast in itself. Um, But the, the point we're at now is is truly phenomenal. I mean, the, the amount of connectivity we have from cell phones to iPads, uh, the internet, smart TVs, uh, 5G, I mean, it's global connectivity. It is the entirety of the world in unison in, in being able to communicate. I mean, unless you're in a third world country where that's not, I mean, there are, there are those places, or you're in China where it's very much determined what you see and what you hear, to some degree, we get the same thing. Uh, we just have a suppression of information in a free state. It happens. But the ability to call and check on your family at almost any time, almost everyone has a phone or some type of device. You know, myself, my wife, my daughter, we all have cell phones. My son has an iPad that I can FaceTime him on. I can track the location of the iPad. Uh, I can track my wife and daughter's locations. 
Um, at least I think I can. I know they can track mine, um, but it's it's unreal at the closeness that that brings to people. You literally can pop up your iPad or your uh, laptop. It's got a built-in microphone, built-in camera, and have the ability to FaceTime, physically see, and you can do the same thing on your phone. Connect with someone on the other side of the world, with family on the other side of the country. It's, it's such an important part of our society as it is today, and it's phenomenal to the extent that it's gotten, and it's only getting more advanced as time goes on. Our growth as a technological civilization is unparalleled by anything we know. And it's impacting us in ways I think we often don't see. I mean, again, to be able to check on my wife and family anytime I want, that's amazing. You know, even even video games, the connectivity uh, of these video games, you know, it's unreal. It, it, it's it's a global network. It's amazing. Medical advancements are are at a rate now, I think, unimagined. Even even doctors of, of the of the late eighteen hundreds would be incapable of imagining the amount of progress and the amount of knowledge and access that doctors now have. I mean. The cell phone, I'm on alone. Here I am. With the ability, through a handheld device and a a microphone headset, to record and transmit, to deliver into your home, into your car, into wherever you are, into your ear, into your wireless earbuds. My transmission. My my data trail, my whatever you call it. I have the ability to send it to you. Instant access. If you have the app and you're subscribed, it's instantaneous from the time I upload to the time you receive. Now, instantaneous, I guess, in the sense of it may take whatever the lag time is between me and you, but to you it's an instant it's all of the program at once. You know, the, the invention of, of radio and what it done to entertainment. The invention of the telephone and what it done to communication. The, the invention of television and what it done to programming. I mean, uh, advertising. These things can't be rivaled. They are steps so far and above and beyond what the people before them really thought were possible. Everyone wants to, to look at the Jetsons and, and Star Wars and whatever the movie, which Star Wars was from a galaxy long ago, so it's actually in the past. But I digress. People want to look at these portrayals of the future from times as recently as the 70s and go, well, we didn't make it. We didn't get there. We don't have the flying cars. We don't have these things. Okay, we don't. But look at what we do have. What we do have is phenomenal. What we do have in many ways far outweighs what we don't have. I mean, the flying car, what's the real advantage to the flying car? On the road, you're basically driving in two dimensions, and we struggle with that. It is one of the few things that we're having a hard time programming AI to do because it's an extremely complicated and intricate process for humans to drive. All the things we do and calculate, it's a testament to how marvelous the technology of the human brain is that AI has a hard time mimicking that currently. Now, AI is is technology that I fear. I won't lie. I always have, ever since a young age, even when it was more science fiction than reality, like it is now. But, not big on AI. 
Love communication. Love to be able to reach people and talk to people. You know, social media is directly derived from this. And we look at how short we fail in meeting the predictions of where we'd be in the future, but we don't look at how far we've come. But mainly we don't look at what spurred those things. We are a culture, a global culture, that is very much invested in um, technological growth and advancement. But we are still at the root of this thing, human. And for as far as written history, and even oral history, goes back, there's one very undeniable thing about humanity. It's profit-driven. It's greedy. The haves always want more, and the have-nots always want more. So our technical progression has been influenced by what makes money. And what makes money is access. We have access. We have the World Wide Web, possibly the greatest innovation of mankind. Total global connectivity. It, it's instant access on so many levels. Even knowledge. Even programming. And thought control. But still, it's, it's instant access on so many levels. The grandest of all of our designs. But it was originally a military idea. A grid away from the, the civilian grid that would allow communication. And my understanding is that that grid's still very much in place. You know, you have the military's version of uh, the internet, you have our version of the internet, and somewhere in between there lies the black web, which is a connection of the two or, or part of, I guess the black web is actually the original military internet, whatever. Uh, look it up, people. I, I'd have to, I don't have the memory to remember all that, but imagine where we'll go from here. Chips inserted into us so that telephone connectivity is instantaneous and partly biological. I mean, we've almost, we've, we've replaced coinage. It, it's, it's almost completely unneeded to this point, but in the process we've almost completely replaced the dollar. Electronic funds and electronic monies will soon take over Apple Pay. Uh, just your just your card. Just just your uh, your ATM debit card. Those things will take over. They will replace the symbol, the current symbol of what most hold so dear. Money, value. And all of these innovations we've gotten have come from the pursuit of money and the pursuit of control because control equals profit. You know, cell phones are very much uh, a military advancement. GPS, what you use to get yourself places, global positioning, that, that's <laughs> completely and totally military ingenuity. We have these listening devices, these spy devices in our houses. We have total connectivity. The phone changed the way people interacted. The home phone, even. Radio changed the way people were entertained. Again, television changed the way we were entertained and, and changed, helped change the way we consumed. Now, social media and smart devices are the next evolution in that process. They're changing how we consume, 
how we consume news, how we consume uh, knowledge, how we can cons- how we interact, how we relate to other people. Physical interaction is more limited now. There's people that that don't like it. I, I think it has the ability to possibly not make it all the way. I'm very torn on that. I want to see the innovation. I want to see how far we can go. I want to see us cure diseases. But I don't want to lose what made us human. I don't want to lose what make, uh, makes us who we are. Is that selfishness on my part? Because maybe in 30 years, conversation as I know it, conversation as this, it's not necessary. Maybe we can say more saying less and we can say it privately or, or we can say it from a distance and we can say it without a human interaction. And maybe that is the best evolution. I don't believe that evolution is always good. I don't believe that change is always good. Just It's often required. Change can be forced. Easily. That's not to say that it doesn't take time and effort, but just as easily as natural progression can be allowed, change can be enforced. We found an easy way. For the first time in human existence, we found an easy way. Look at the difference between what we have here in the United States and what a third world nation suffers through. We found an easy way. When you find an easy way to do things, an easy way to make money, that doesn't mean everybody here makes money easy. It doesn't. I don't make money easy. It doesn't mean everybody here makes money at the same rate, at the same level, but the the pursuit and the desire is to make money the same way that the richest make it, which is at the easiest level. The way we obtain food is very easy. I mean, yes, we have starving people here, but not like other countries have. Not to the degree that other people have. You know, uh, it, it, it changes who you are based on how hard your life is. How hard life has been for you up to a certain point. People may believe they've had a hard life. But if they're not hard people and they're not doing hard things, then maybe they haven't. And some people you may believe are soft. Are much harder than you'll ever be because they've had that hard life. They've learned to appreciate things. They've learned to to put a value on different things. Is that lost in the technological world? Is it lost in the artificial world? Where's the value? Where's the value in a text? Well, I like a text. I I like a message because sometimes it allows me to communicate with people that I'm not going to be able to communicate with in any other way for that time being. And for that, it's priceless. But for me, it could never replace physical interaction. It could never replace this drive I have to communicate verbally and have the rebuttal be verbal. Making this disease, coronavirus, just off topic and and honestly just popped in my head, the perfect disease for the new world we live in. The antisocial disease for the antisocial person. But you see a lot of flack and you see a lot of a spirit of, of people who still want to be connected because there's people that are dumbly so, I will say, um, ignoring these separations and, and getting together. And I don't promote that. I think um, there has to be a level uh, of, of uh, caution with <laughs> all rebellious acts, and that's not rebellious or cautious, it's just stupid. Um, but I see us changing and moving, and I see a societal shift, a shift in communication, a shift in how we interact with each other. I see that, and 
I'm concerned. The question is, am I rightfully concerned? Am I concerned because it's something to be concerned about? Or am I, excuse me, am I concerned because I'm the old guard? I'm the past. I'm that middle child of evolution. Not quite the same as the people in the 80s who had no exposure. The people who were 20 in 1979. Or 40 in 1979. Or 50 in 1979. Not quite the same as those born in 2000. Who are immersed. Not nowhere near the same as those born in 2010 who can't imagine life without full connectivity. That middle child. (laughs) The bastard of evolution. There you go. Maybe that's what I am and maybe that's why I struggle so much. It's such a love-hate relationship as someone who knows life before it to some degree even though it's been there longer for me now I guess than not but I remember the time without I remember my experience in life and I understand how I want to interact and I don't see it in my children I don't see it in kids don't see it in teenagers. I'm starting to not see it in some adults. I see it in, in much older individuals. I see it in some individuals younger than me. It's not across the board. But it's it's a majority thing. And the majority of it stops with my generation. And even many in my generation have completely been pulled into this. And I see people like Steve Jobs. And I see people that are the heads of these tech companies. And... and the heads of Twitter and Facebook and other, saying, no, we limit our children. We limit what they can see. They don't have full access, yet we don't do that. I don't do that. Full access to YouTube. My son doesn't know about TV. My son doesn't. I mean, he's, he's like a, a walking history book. He can tell you all about Saturday morning cartoons, and he can tell you all this because he's fascinated with animation. But it's not because of an experience with it. His experience and his knowledge comes from an untethered Attachment to YouTube and, and what do you do? Do you isolate him from it? Do you put him behind his peers? Do you limit that? Do you limit his ability to grow and evolve as those around him? Do you put him behind now? Do you stop it now so that he's behind twenty years from now? Do you embrace it and let it go? Where's the balance? What's the right answer? Well, I don't know. If I did, I probably wouldn't have done this podcast. I don't know where the right direction is. I don't know if it's fear that makes me uncomfortable. If it's selfishness and an unwillingness to change and grow. Because that's possible. But I don't know if it's not an acceptable, appropriate amount of fear and apprehension that I have and what we will become. But I do know this. I do know that even if it's the right thing to do, even if it's our next evolutionary step to become one with technology, even if our growth is unstoppable, if the change is inevitable, even if it's 100% the best thing for humanity. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it feels or smells or tastes. It's got no soul. It's got no honesty to it. It has no value to me. Again, that could just be selfish. That could be holding on to the past. Because we're all guilty of it to some degree. And 
And I understand that it's a very, very dangerous thing. Holding on too hard to the past, too tight. Not letting yourself grow and breathe is a horrible, horrible thing. It's smothering. It's smothering to those around you, and it's smothering to your progression as a person. Blindly following any progression, I feel to be just as troublesome. You usually get one quote per podcast. Sometimes you get more. You've had one. You're going to get more. Bukowski said, can you remember who you were before the world told you who you should be? It's a very important question. Because maybe it's the answer to why I feel the way I feel. Because I remember who I was as that kid. And I remember the value of interaction. When I have a memory, when, when I'm on here and I'm podcasting, and like the, the, the music and memories one or any of them, you don't hear me talk about, oh man, that time we were all online together in a chat group, and it is that of my age, of my experience, or is that because that's not how we are designed to interact. That we remember those personal interactions. We remember those physical interactions. We remember those times that we were actually physically together. I can remember talking to someone on the phone on that. I can remember that. But not the way I can remember spending time with my friends. I can remember what yesterday looked like, smelt like, felt like. I had such a great day. I took a long walk. I went kayaking. My wife and son and I played uh, badminton out in the yard. Uh, we had a small little fire for just a little bit last night. I can remember that. And I can remember what it looked like. And I can tell you this, for as beautiful as the sun was yesterday, and as hard as it shined, and as warm as it was, it felt fuzzy and dull. It felt different than the sun in my memories. The sun I remember from 1988, the sun I remember from 1994, that sun was brighter. That sun felt different. That air smelt different. It had a different view. Almost as if that sun was real. And the sun I seen yesterday was digital. I don't believe the sun I saw yesterday was digital. Was digital. But maybe I only see in digital. And I want to see in analog. And just because something's newer doesn't make it better. Just because something is a natural progression for something else doesn't mean it's improving doesn't mean it's not. I wrote a poem once. And it was about drug addiction. It's my own poem. So I don't even know if it counts as a quote. But it's about the effects of drugs. And this it's about this young girl who she got hooked on drugs and and she's she's struggling with all these things and, and it becomes clear that something's changed in her mind. She no longer dreams in the warm, fuzzy colors that she used to dream. All the lines in her dreams are sharp and pointed. All the colors dulled and black. All the sky's gray. She dreams in digital. All the pure natural essence of her dreams was taken away. Now in writing that poem I never knew what the drug was. 
sometimes that stuff just comes to you. I don't know. Looking back now, it becomes painfully clear to me that maybe that drug was technology. Maybe that drug was connectivity. Maybe we could progress much further and much connect on a much higher level if it become more personal, if it become more physical. It's not to say to get rid of this. I want to be able to pick up this phone and I want to be able to record this podcast and I want to be able to ship it to you. I want to be able to track my family and know where they are. Almost every discussion I've had as a child was about what if, what if, what if, what if. if? And then you get older and it becomes which one? Which one? Which one? It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. It just takes responsibility. It takes restraint. Something I don't often have. <laughs> I'm on a hiatus from social media now because of the its ability to influence me and, and my inability to control it. So I sit and I say, what if this is bad? What if we're too connected? What if it's much more important that we focus on the physical interaction and make the technical, technological interaction secondary? What if? Not which one. Not pick one. Not here's a gun to your head. Decide now. Facebook forever, which I think means I'm old because other people don't like Facebook and it's apparently the only social media that can attract me. <laughs> I've noticed that. But it's not. It's Facebook forever or it's, it's talking to people in person forever. Now, this is that. One of my best friends, one of my best friends in the world, he doesn't listen to this podcast. If he does, I don't know about it. He's never mentioned it to me. I don't even know if he knows what a podcast is. We've done a podcast together once. He says it's the first one he ever listened to. We're complete opposites on most things. We are. We just There's not a lot about us. We message constantly. I talk to him as much on Messenger as I do my wife. On text. It, it, it's, it's constant. We're talking. But we get together when we can and we interact with each other. I've got another friend that I don't get to interact with as much as that one. But she's a very big part of, of my history, of my childhood. And I always feel really good when I get to see her. And my wife's really good friends with her. So that makes it like a cool thing that it's something that, you know, when you, when you and your wife share a real friend. Like that's different than sharing someone you met after you got married. Someone we both have history with. I talk to her all the time on Messenger. Just as much as I do anybody else. Probably talk to her more on Messenger than anybody besides my wife. But when it's possible to physically interact, we do it. And although it's not very often, it feels good. I get just as much out of that electronic communication as I can. But it's so reinforced by that physical interaction that's where the value of people come from for me and maybe I'm wrong maybe that's not what it should be or how it has to be or even what it really is but that's what it is to me either way no one's holding a gun to my head and saying this or that which one I say what if what if we just make the decision to do it in equal portions or unequal portions but at least we find a way to make sure that we show our children and the people around us that are not from the same... Tr- <laughs> they aren't as old as us, I guess is the easiest way to say it. The value of personal interaction. I've not done that. Not the way I should. Not, not the way that would make it understandable to my son that this matters. But it's something I want to do. This gets credited to Oppenheimer all the time. It's actually from a Tibetan book, I believe. It's a Tibetan, not the Book of the Dead, but it's from a Tibetan book. I actually have it. Um, It may be Book of the Dead. I'll have to look it up. I don't know. Uh, It's my podcast. I can be as inaccurate as I want to be. But Oppenheimer's the one that always gets the the credit for it. And he gets the credit for it after... um, 
he came over and made us a bomb that we used on the Japanese. I wonder if he were here now and that monstrosity was taken away and I'm in no way comparing technology to to something that could do that damage and the loss of life in places like Hiroshima. But in regards to how technology affects human interaction, Oppenheimer said, now I am death, the destroyer of worlds. I'm digital, in your ear right now, destroyer of all communication. (laughs) 